Between the time of blast computing and the rise of always online single player games, there was an age undreamed of. And unto this, Capcom, destined to bear the jeweled crown of horror gaming upon an itchy, scratchy brow. Let me tell you of the days of high experimentation within the genre of survival horror. During this forgotten age, aka the mid-90s, Capcom's marketing team coined the term for the launch of their shiny new horror IP. And after it became a smash success as the most sold horror game of all time, at the time, virtually everyone wanted a slice of the pie. Best example is Konami, who pretty much assembled a team and told them to make something like this. And this bunch went wild and weird and artsy with it and created something truly original and sublime with the Silent Hill franchise. But a lot of other studios attempted to tap into the survival horror boom as well, many trying to bring the one or the other innovative twist and variation to the formula. Parasite Eve and Kudelka married survival horror gameplay with turn-based strategy. Galarians went psychic with its combat approach. The Clock Tower series focused on even stronger levels of slasher movie-like disempowerment. And Kenji Ino kept blessing us with wonderfully weird and experimental creations such as D and Enemy Zero, just to name a few. Today I want to talk about Atlas. Yep, the Shin Megami Tensei guys, long before Persona had overshadowed its forefather with never-ending milking cycles of fighting and dancing games. Hell, Persona hadn't even been invented by then. They also, right before the turn of the millennium, tried to plant their flag in the still highly uncharted survival horror terrain, with a critically overlooked and, in my humble opinion, highly underrated experimental subterranean first-person horror thriller, Hell Knight. It's an absolutely fascinating, tight and focused horror thrill ride that literally pioneered mechanics that have by now become established and beloved staples in horror gaming and almost nailed a lot of them on the first try. All this unleashed on an audience of game critics that was barely able to comprehend nor appreciate what Hell Knight tried and successfully achieved to deliver. Wrapped in a captivating apocalyptic setting with a hearty dollop of corny 90s charm and audiovisual aesthetics that, especially today, evoke pungently sweet pangs of nostalgia for a bygone technological era, Atlas's Hell Knight is a bona fide case for far ahead of its time. Or rather, pearls before swine. See, I've been doing retrospectives on older video games on my channel for quite a few years now, and there's one part about it that's been increasingly grinding my gears. One part of my research process is always to see how did people perceive the game at the time. So I dig up all the contemporaneous reviews that I can find in internet archives, and I've noticed that game journalists really don't actually seem to like video games at all. Like for instance, almost reliably with every classic survival horror game that tried something original that wasn't as mainstream popular as a Resident Evil, you'll be hard pressed to find anyone who isn't highly critical of anything that isn't how basically loudly disincentivizing anything that strays from the beaten path. It's been so common to find this. Like, if you don't believe me, there's some all-time greatest hits reviews that pan even Silent Hill 2 for how bad it was because it was so different. Atlas's Hell Knight is, so far, one of the most facepalm-inducing examples of this trend I've encountered in my years. It's been released in the summer of 1998 in Japan under the title Dark Messiah. Not the one with the kick. And in European markets, rebranded as Hell Knight and translated to English, German and French, it came out one day before the turn of the millennium in December 1999, which is ironic on its own considering how the game's plot revolves in good part around a millennium doomsday prophecy which, by the time the vast majority of the European audience even got to play it, was already obsolete. Because yeah, as we can see, the world didn't implode on New Year's Eve, which took the edge of so many prophecies, predictions, cults and media plots around the time. It was quite the market, I tell you. But yeah, back to Hell Knight. You did, in fact, hear that right. This game was 
only ever released in Europe. It never saw the light of day in the US, nor in Canada, or for that matter, any other region on the globe outside of Japan and a small selection of European countries, excluding, among many others, even the United Kingdom. And in the countries it got released, it only received a very limited amount of printed copies, which made it extremely hard to acquire on launch already, and here comes the biggest crux, it went so under the radar that it was barely reviewed by the bigger outlets of the gaming press, only getting some attention from mostly smaller outlets here and there who, there's no other way to put it, really didn't get the game at all. Bad reviewer scores, like I mean abysmal, were rather common, and the ones that actually saw it for what it was were far and few in between, which definitely added to Hell Knight completely flying under the radar, commercially and critically. Japanese reviewers gave it far more evenly distributed scores, averaging somewhere in the mid to high 70s regions, which is honestly a far more accurate and video game media literate representation of the trailblazing experimental qualities Atlas brought to the survival horror table with it. The year is 1999, it is the future. You, a resident of bright and bustling Tokyo, are on your way home on the subway when a catastrophic accident causes the death of 56 passengers. Luckily, you and a young girl named Naomi find yourself in the wreckage as survivors. But alas, the true horror is only about to begin when the two of you find yourself stalked by a monstrous creature that came from God knows where. Desperately, you escape your pursuer into the Mesh, a large-scale underground shelter built by the Japanese army during the war that is now occupied by a population of underground residents who have fled and completely abandoned life above the surface. It's a super unique and appropriately oppressive and claustrophobic setting for a survival horror adventure that puts full emphasis on loneliness, isolation and hopelessness in the face of overwhelming odds. Now it does make me wonder where the people down here in the mesh source their food supply so completely cut off from the surface. Because unlike us, they don't have access to services like HelloFresh. <laughs> Alright, that was a terrible segue, I just couldn't resist. But yeah, HelloFresh is in fact the sponsor of this video, which I'm actually quite excited about. HelloFresh is a meal kit service that delivers seasonal recipes with pre-measured ingredients straight to your door. See, a lot of creators on here talk about how stress-free it makes your daily cooking, how it takes away the burden of grocery shopping and having to come up with what to make every day, etc. And while that is 100% true and cool, I'm personally someone who actually loves cooking. I cook at home for me and my partner practically every day and I rarely ever consider it a chore, but rather a relaxing wind-down time. And HelloFresh's deliveries have been such a fun addition to that. I can pick on their website three or more meals for each week in advance with lots of different options. Like As a vegetarian, I love that it offers plenty of meat-free dishes. The meals always came on time with lots of great quality fresh ingredients packed in cooling bags and what I also noticed with surprisingly eco-friendly packaging. And the cooking process itself was just fun. Neat and easy to follow recipe cards color-coded to match the pre-packed ingredients. And hey, nobody says you have to follow everything to the T. Add your own personality to it if you like. Having HelloFresh gave me lots of ideas for new dishes and variations and things to try in the future as well. I've signed up with HelloFresh for this sponsorship deal, but I'm definitely sticking around. I'm loving this. So if you'd like to give it a try, then make sure to use the link I've provided in the description or go to HelloFresh.com and use the code POGROGSOG16 to get 16 free meals across 7 boxes plus 3 surprise gifts. It's quite a generous offer actually, and hey, it'll help me out as well if you use my promo code for this. Once you click, my video's description will live update to tally the purchases. Technology, man. Anyway, thanks a lot again to our sponsor, and now I hope you enjoy the rest of the video. Down here in the mesh, your goal is simple. Without any direct means of defending yourself, you flee your relentless pursuer and try to find a way back to the surface. In essence, Hell Knight plays like a hybrid of an immersive sim light interlogged with pretty classic adventure gameplay. In the open segments, your character navigates the dark and claustrophobic maze-like hallways of the mesh while being constantly pursued by the monster. So you have to be mindful of your surroundings and environs and keep a good sense of situational awareness to always stay on top of your adversary's current locations and outmaneuver it to reach different locations. Once you enter these locations, the game switches to pre-rendered backgrounds, still first person, and presents the players with inventory puzzles and character dialogue that has an effect on the world outside in the open areas. A very basic example, in the first segment of the game, we, together with Naomi as a companion character, attempt to find a way out of the sewers. When we find that a path through ankle-deep sewage water is blocked by an open electric wire, 
We have to search the cavernous maze for a generator room, but this one is locked, so we have to scout around again until we find a means to get access. Then switch off the breaker and ultimately get through the path that was previously blocked and escape to the next section of the tunnel system. All of this we have to achieve while the monster is constantly on our tail. That's where the stress comes in. In this first segment, this is still fairly easy, as the monster is still rather slow and languid, easy to predict and see coming from a mile away. Well, okay, not a mile, because the drawing distance is quite low, because it's very dark down here, and the PS1 famously couldn't render so many polygons at a time, but since the game's main antagonist turns out to be an escaped, failed scientific mutation experiment, it changes over the course of the game into stronger, smarter, and more agile iterations and versions of itself that keep upping the ante and the players on their toes. The monster's designs, look, and animations, while never directly causing the blood to freeze in your veins probably, exert a very uncanny valley-like, ragdoll, animatronic-like feeling of unease, like a Geiger-esque body horror apparition that imitates the motions of human beings but lacks the natural instincts to properly operate its limbs. And it quite reliably manages to get the blood pumping, especially in the moments when you can't currently see it and can only guess to its current position through the phenomenal use of positional audio the game employs. This is one of those titles that don't feature any sort of scripted ass-in-your-face jump scares, but can very easily get you to start in suspense and surprise from emergent gameplay when your pursuer pops up in front of you when you least expect it. And it does that without ever cheating it into your path. Which is remarkable if you ask me, considering how many modern games still do that. Disempowerment is the core gameplay tenet of Hell Knight, and I find it truly impressive how Atlas both understood and then firmly doubled down on this game design premise at a time over a decade before the horror game trend of defenseless POV protagonist games carved it hollow. And it's equally remarkable how many of the aspects that are paramount for this type of experience it nails basically on the first try. For instance, the game's incredibly skilled use of sound and music design. The score is adequately minimalistic and during the first-person gameplay segments exclusively used to underline and amplify the game's tension, and it pulls that off remarkably, gluing the environments and gameplay together while the expert use of sound effects on a hardware this limited perfectly functions as a vital part of the gameplay itself, because your ears are one of your most important tools in figuring out where danger is at, with footsteps and roars giving you indicators of which routes are more likely dangerous or safe. It works tremendously well, considering the age and technological limitations of this game and the pioneering position within its genre, I find this aspect even a good bit more impressive than the so often praised surround audio in the quite similarly structured Alien Isolation, for instance. As I've said in previous videos, I personally prefer to not try and judge if a video game is good or bad, because these adjectives are wishy-washy and don't say much at all in the grand scheme. But rather to ask, does the game achieve to deliver the experience it aims to get across? Yes, Hell Knight's locations are sterile and drab at times, which can make the experience feel very detached, but this is very much the whole point, I think. The game's emotional objective is to make the players feel truly lost and alone and hopeless down here in the mesh. And the utter isolation and claustrophobia imbued by these locations paired with the gameplay absolutely pulls that off. Okay, like, I'm gushing a lot about this game, and I clearly adore it, but don't think that Hell Knight is somehow an absolutely perfect, flawless game. It's not. I consider it a rough diamond that clearly lacks polish in many places to make it truly shine. But considering that it was made on a shoestring budget, and also considering how games like Alien Isolation, that have 20 years more of technological and game design evolution in its back to support its development, plus dozens of times the size of development teams working on it, it's all the more remarkable if you consider how many things Hell Knight's devs clearly understood about this completely new concept they approached and incorporated as well as they could. Like the fact that the monster is really not tethered to the player, but the game gives you enough leeway to often have large stretches of 10-20 minutes without any encounters, only for the sudden reappearance of the monster to be that much more effective and shocking. This is something that even Alien Isolation didn't get right. It plays much better if you install a mod that untethers the alien from you, making it more realistic, you know. And appropriate for an early Japanese survival horror game, Hell Knight gets weird and trippy and deeply psychological in a way you wouldn't expect when you first start out in the sewers. To me, the entirety of the game felt like experiencing a vertical cut through the Alien movie franchise. I mean, the first four. 
You start out with a small group of people in a rather narrow environment pitted against a supernatural foe and try to survive against the overwhelming odds. And over time, the monster iterates, mutates into stronger, more advanced versions of itself, forcing you to adapt to keep surviving. And also, more sketchy characters get introduced and some form of military gets involved in the fight with heavier armament as you go. And more and more, you uncover conspiracy about why the things that are happening down here are happening in the first place. And then towards the end, it gets deeply psychedelic and trippy and surprisingly personal as well. That's essentially the emotional core of Alien 1 through 4, packed in a 1998 PlayStation 1 first-person survival horror title, and set in an extremely unique setting that takes lots of inspiration from fascinating real-world locations such as the now decommissioned Tokyo sewer system, it doesn't get much more avant-garde than this. Hellnight is overall a pretty short game. If you play it for the first time, you're probably going to need somewhere between 5 to 8 hours on average to finish it. And you can get from intro to credits in 3 to 4 hours if you know what you're doing. But aside from the fact that as a busy adult with an endless backlog, I endlessly appreciate games that get across what they want in the time it needs without any excess padding, there's also the fact that Hell Knight actually brings really good replay value. And it pulls that off with a seriously clever approach to branching storytelling directly tied to gameplay, player choice, player performance, and consequences derived thereof. Actually, yeah, this can easily fill up an entire chapter. Or in older YouTube days when the Eldritch algorithm didn't yet punish videos for being less than feature length, it would have been more than enough for an entire listicle video. So let's make this a top 5 reasons Hell Knight was totally ahead of its time. Number 1. Hell Knight was seriously trailblazing as one of the, if not the, earliest first-person survival horror game without direct combat and thereby preceded the post-amnesia to outlast to PT wave of defenseless protagonist horror experiences by over a decade. Number two, which is related but definitely worth pointing out as an individual point, equally it's also one of the earliest instances of the one single stalker type antagonist pursues you relentlessly type horror games, which was pioneered by Clock Tower in rather point and clicky fashion. As a fully 3D representation of this trope, it could maybe be considered to be preceded by Resident Evil 2 with the occurrence of the Tyrant, but that's only a small part of the game and only really got expanded to central gameplay component proportions with its remake in 2019. As such, Hell Knight is the first purebred stalker horror game in full 3D, preceding games like Clock Tower 3 and Haunting Ground by half a decade and the full-blown trend this horror gaming subgenre has turned into, especially since Alien Isolation and Resident Evil 7 again, but basically two full decades. Number 3. Hell Knight creates replayability in what is essentially a classic adventure game through one of the most interesting approaches in branching narrative gameplay I've come across. Honestly. Basically, it pulls this off through its unique take on party and character companion systems. In the beginning of the game, you're accompanied by Naomi, the other survivor of the subway crash. During the first person segments, it's easy to forget that she's in your party, but you'll notice it when she comments on certain points of interest in the game or partakes in conversation with characters you meet and interact with. Across the game, though, you meet multiple other characters that can potentially team up with you and join you on your foray through the mesh. To be exact, four characters, all of which are introduced in the wonderfully 90s graphic design is my passion cinematic opening cutscene. There's a twist, though. You can only have one companion at a time, and you cannot actively dismiss a character from your party. The only way to reduce your party size to one, like only yourself, and thereby create an opening for another companion is for them to die. So essentially, if you get caught by the monster while Naomi is with you, she will serve as a buffer. The monster gets her, she dies, and you carry on to live another day. Should you get caught by the monster now, all alone, the game's over for good. But should you make it to a point where you meet one of the potential sidekicks, they will accompany you from that point on. This not only changes vast portions of the dialogue and comments on events and places you traverse, but it also strongly influences the final section and respectively the ending of the game, which revolves around the apocalyptic doomsday cult's efforts to summon the Japanese title drop Dark Messiah. And depending on which character, if any, you end up accompanying until the end, the outcome of the story will drastically change, with clearly better and worse endings. Which is, number four, a dynamic adaptive morality system that reacts to player choice and performance. 
With this, it once again preceded the genius use of hidden player choice in Silent Hill 2 by several years. The beauty here is that the outcome of the story is directly tied to how willing the players are to put in the extra effort to save a character from certain death, or, if you will, how ready players are to sacrifice an innocent bystander for their own survival. Because going for the easier option in essence leads to a gradually worse outcome. It's not quite as binary black and white, but this is essentially the gist of how it operates. I think that's truly genius. Not just because it creates actual replay value and you get more dialogue depending on who you play with, and because it incorporates judging the player's performance without finger-wavy on-screen prompts, but also because, number five, Hell Knight essentially features an adaptive difficulty system. Mark Brown with Game Maker's Toolkit famously raved about Resident Evil 4's hidden adaptive difficulty system that analyzes how well a player performs from segment to segment and then automatically adjusts future encounters in order to make the game always challenging enough while never too frustrating, in theory, individually adjusted to each player's skill level by performance. And while this is, both on a technical and game design level, a formidable achievement, it also caused a lot of players to feel like air streaming out of a balloon once they knew this system was there and saw it in action. Because to many, it created this subconscious feeling of being patronized. Video game difficulty has been a hotly debated game design topic for ages and it'll probably never get solved, but I find the sleekness of Hell Knight's companion system so incredibly impressive, especially in the context of its time. Because your companion doesn't just influence dialogue and endings, they also play differently. Naomi, your first starter, is not a fighter and is such frail and helpless against the monster. If you get caught with her in tandem, she dies immediately. Her central ability is that she can actually get a fix on the monster for you if it's in your vicinity, making it visible on the minimap. This can be incredibly helpful. The other companions have been down here in the mesh for longer and as such are far more hard-boiled. If the monster catches you with them, they're capable enough to stun and repel it, which essentially serves as an extra life. The later in the game the companions you encounter, the more times they can pull this off, or more efficiently, until, well, if you get caught one too many times, they also bite the dust eventually. This is, yeah, essentially saying, okay, the player didn't manage to survive with a high school girl, maybe René, the French investigative journalist intent on exposing the cult's evil machinations who brought a Mac-10 just in case, or Kyoji, a literal serial killer with a revolver he snatched from the body of his first victim, or hell, Ivanov, a Russian army veteran who knows his way around assault rifles, rocket launchers and flamethrowers, might help them to survive a bit more efficiently. I love how this seemingly understated companion system, if you put it under the magnifying glass, turns out to fulfill so many different game design purposes all in one, sleekly and elegantly, and completely in resonance with the narrative according to the player's personal version of the journey. The simplicity of it is nothing short of brilliant. Atlas was onto something here. Their first and only foray into survival horror ended up being financially very underwhelming, but that's not really a big surprise now, is it? If you barely distribute it to worldwide markets without any chance to catch the attention of the bigger and more influential game journalistic outlets of the time, and then only dish out a comparable handful of copies in total, you can't be dumbfounded if you only sell a small amount of copies as a result. It's hard to say for certain if it was because of the disappointing numbers on Atlas' business department spreadsheets or because of the bafflingly narrow-minded and unfair coverage it received from those outlets that ended up covering it, or because of a combination of both. But ultimately, Atlas decided that they burned their fingers with Dark Messiah and that survival horror was not for them. Which is, pardon my French, a damn fucking shame. The reviews of the time, in many ways and in hindsight even more so, absolutely prove that what Hell Knight tried here was, in fact, totally ahead of its time. Most of those who did write the tests on it seriously didn't understand the experience this game attempted to get across and kept complaining over and over how this is not like the other games in the genre, you know, the ones that all my friends like, the ones that I understand. The scores in Japan, as I said before, pointed far more accurately to a good 7 out of 10, which is, as you know, as someone who loathes numerical scores in general, one of my favorite ratings a game can achieve, because in so many cases it points to the will to experiment and walk off the beaten path, 
janky, imperfect maybe, but interesting games in one way or another so often end up within this range. I'm convinced that if they hadn't dropped it, but iterated on what they established with Hell Knight, taken what worked and perfected it and improved or changed what didn't work, I'm sure that Atlas could have caught up with Konami and Capcom in the survival war market, similar to how their Shin Megami Tensei series eventually firmly cemented its foothold along JRPG juggernauts, at least with the eventual breakthrough popularity of the Persona spin-off. Which was technically a spin-off of a spin-off. Man, SMT is a weird beast. But that's for another day. For Hell Knight, not just as a horror game carving new pathways, but also, honestly, I think the mesh, this subterranean society below Tokyo, it's such an interesting place to begin with. And by never delivering a sequel or anything the likes, it left an endless maze of potential completely unexplored, unchartered and forgotten. I'm usually very much of the opinion that not every piece of media needs to be blown up into a massive cinematic universe with every fart having an origin story, but the mesh? I'd have loved for this to be explored further and expanded into a deeper narrative universe. Holy freaking shit. Hell Knight is the definition of a forgotten gem. Even among genre fans, this game is more of a niche title to boast your retro game connoisseur cred with, and especially Atlas seems to have no love or interest in adequately maintaining their catalog past a certain expiration date and making their classics accessible. A great example is how Atlas announced Devil's Summoner Soul Hackers 2 recently to the surprise of many, of which the predecessor was released on a multitude of platforms including the Super Famicom, PSX and 3DS, but only the 3DS version was ever released in a translated version to the West. And Soul Hackers itself is a spin-off of a spin-off of Shin Megami Tensei, namely the original Devil Summoner, and that one has never been translated. So people interested in Soul Hackers 2 who'd love to catch up on everything that happened before, everything it's based on, have to get a 3DS and potentially learn Japanese to go the whole nine yards. Hell Knight Dark Messiah luckily has seen a sparsely rollout translation into English, French and German, but it was never released on any other platform than the PSX after its original launch, never been ported to any digital distribution storefront, and with its very limited numbers during its first run, it's quite hard to obtain on the second-hand market for a reasonable price. You'll easily dish out a hundred bucks or more for used copies. This neglective treatment is absolutely undeserved. Far more uninteresting games have been ported and brought back to modern systems, and especially Hell Knight as one of the absolute progenitors of the relentless and invincible stalker type horror games whose popularity has so surged into mainstream gaming culture over the past decade is more than ripe for a horror connoisseur's second wind fan awakening. Which, put on the record. Bell. is why emulation is awesome. It's effectively the only viable way to play Hell Knight today on your computer or on a multitude of different platforms with relative ease and convenience. The download of ROMs is also de facto not illegal or criminalized and it's currently the best and most publicly available archival solution for this game to date. The footage in this video was recorded on a Windows 10 PC using the ePSXE PlayStation emulator with only the resolution slightly amped up from the original PS1 screen resolution. And it ran flawlessly and fabulously. If you'd like to try it out for yourself, this time I'm not doing it with a link to a document in the description of this video, but instead here's an overview of all the settings you need to set up Hell Knight in the same way I've done it to record the footage for this video on ePSXE version 2.0.5. Go ahead and copy my homework if you want to skip futzing around with setting it up on your own. Seriously, go give it a shot. Approach it with an open mind and you'll see what I mean. I don't think you're gonna regret it. And this brings us to the end of this video and I say thank you for listening to me gush about a nearly forgotten classic at length once more. If this was your first video of mine, hey, I'm Ragnar and in this series, Monsters of the Week, I cover old games and indie games with a penchant for horror, the dark and the macabre and try to bring attention to overlooked, maybe forgotten gems that I think shouldn't be forgotten. For the next month I got a few really exciting things planned, like I've been working on a long, like seriously humongously long video on Gothic 3, and after my Clock Tower 3 video recently, I'm finally going to tackle the spiritual successor, one of my most requested titles of all time. Yes, the other PS2 survival horror game with dog next to Rule of Rose, you know what it is. And you know the drill. 
thank you for enabling me to do this and continue doing this. I love what I'm doing and these videos are in large part funded by my generous Patreon supporters and that is what does and what has kept the light on for this channel for so many years now. Incredibly grateful, not just for the support but also for the lovely community that has emerged from that. If you'd like to help out as well, you can do so over on my Patreon, links in the description, and you also get some neat rewards such as access to my production blog, early access versions of my videos, access to the Patreon Discord, access to the scripts I'm writing while I'm writing them, as well as your name in the credits. So maybe in the near future your lovely name might be among those that I'm going to thank personally at the end of my videos, such as this time, Nikot the Brave, Billy Lott, Isabella Stoner, Shannon Blue, Kevin H. Yang, Catherine Escobar, Nathan Gillick, Laird Wackala, David Zalanak, Kerry George, Tleben, Thomas Bona, Giselle, Casper Rahm, Federico Rocha, Morgan Kay, Baruga Dono, Matt Gretton, Hippo Hobbley, Kyle Lee, Nineball9606, Swagam, Aurora Melpomene Crescendo, The Spiral Architect, Terra Flops, Agustin Ortega, Lillen B, Samantha, Daniela Alvarez, Tabby, Jin Hansen, Chuck Taylor, Dylan Labonte, Terry Collins, Lawrence E. Buben, Ian Rhodes, Amber Wiggins, Mura Casardes, Cordelia Crescendo, Hunter Crawford and Margaret Strawn, Ronan Crom, aka Daniel242172, Vasily Prokhorov, Dr. Haley Isabella Colley, Corey Marr, Gehanas, Dana Rosa, Boris Googling, Chrissy, Neil Snowden, Max Macula, Kenan Ward, Uziel 1447, Giselle Almonte, Sterina Abramson, Swiss Hackmod, Raisha Griggs, Amanda Christensen, Refkins, Alex Popov, John Boring, Maria Rios, Refkins and Triscuits, Felix, and Sable Cowell. Until next time, ta-ta.